Okay, here we go. Our first cardiovascular and pulmonary pathology lecture for the winter of 2021. That I just call it CVPP, <coughs> or CVP for short. And pretty much a review today of stuff that you already know. We'll talk about anatomy histology, the concept of beaver dams, and yep, yeah, here we go. Here's this class. Uh, I built this class from scratch using these texts. So Rubens and Robbins I refer to a lot. These are on the list of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. So questions for, uh, for the boards will come from these two books, as well as Guyton, uh, as well as Bates. That's the uh, Bates and Seidel are the books I used. Where's Seidel? <coughs> Uh, let's see. Did I not put Cetal? Cetal I use as well. But anyway, that's where the questions come from. McGee is not um, uh, a, or Jarvis is not a Board of Chiropractic Examiner book, so I don't know why people use that. I don't use it. Alright, so anyway, that's where things were built from. Let's get to it. A circulatory system. We'll or hopefully you know something about that. I'm sure you do. You've all been through anatomy. Uh, but it's basically the kind of the pipes and the roads and, or the highways of the body. It delivers oxygen, hormones, nutrients, all cells in order for all body tissue. Of course, it's made of cells. In order for body tissue and cells to stay alive, they need oxygen. And they need to get rid of waste. They need to get rid of their CO2. Uh, they need more oxygen, right? They need nitrogen and glucose and all sorts of stuff. Circulatory system also helps with immunosurveillance. If you get a bug in your blood uh, that runs into white blood cells patrolling the bloodstream and send, sets off an alarm so you can fight that bug. Circulatory system is built, divided into two divisions. Uh, the cardiovascular system, which we'll spend most of our time on, but we'll talk about the lymph system as well, the lymphatic system. The cardiovascular system can be broken down into four parts. There is a pulmonary loop or pulmonary system, uh, which runs from the heart to the lungs and back to the, specifically it runs from the right heart to the lungs back to the left heart. Then there's a systemic loop, which is much more extensive. Sometimes that's called the peripheral system, the systemic system. That runs from the left heart uh, to the body and the head, and then back to the right heart. does not include the lungs. That would be the pulmonary system or pulmonary loop. And then we have two pumps. We have the pump that we all know is the heart. The pump that you may not know is the calf muscle pump. Um, be, the calf has a honeycomb network of of venous veins, uh, and it's filled with veins. And the blood has to kind of pools in the calf, and m mainly the soleus, if you want to get specific. And then when you're up and standing and walking, and even just standing there and swaying back and forth, when the soleus contracts, it squeezes blood up toward the heart. So that's important because we don't have, it's kind of hard to get, especially when you get older. It's hard to get blood out of your lower extremities, especially if you're standing all day long. And so that's an important this calf muscle pump. The thighs help a little bit. Some of the deep uh, veins run through the uh, thigh muscles as well. It helps, but it's not nearly as important as the calf muscle pump. And then, of course, the lungs are the other component of the cardiovascular system and just here's just kind of a and we all know this right the the pathway here uh, where it leaves the right ventricle goes through the lungs comes back into the left atrium then it's pumped out the ascending aorta around the aorta arch and down the aorta so it goes up to the head so I'm assuming you know that you're going to be lost in this class if you don't know the highways here the pump the plumbing system just another picture um, showing the kind of the plumbing system here of the body, showing different pulses that we'll look at in lab. I think you know some of them already. All right, meet the beaver. 
Uh, so this is The Beaver. This is a sitcom back in the 60s. I used to watch this when I was a little kid. A little mischievous. They called him The Beaver. I'm not sure why he got that nickname, actually. But he was always in trouble. Um, and this is The Real Beaver. Why am I talking about beavers? I will actually talk about beavers and beaver dams quite a bit in this class. And so if you don't understand the beaver dam concept, you're going to have trouble understanding uh, this class. So uh, the trouble it's not really the beaver that's the trouble. It's what it likes to do, right? If we have a river here with water flowing that way, what do beavers like to do? They like to build dams, right, with sticks. They like to dam things up. They're smart because they want they live in the water and they build a, a little little kind of beaver house of sticks. So if you dam that up, the water backs up like crazy, right? And you've made a little kind of little lake there for yourself. And then the water just kind of trickles out down here. Uh, we can use that concept all the time uh, for atherosclerosis, for tumors. Uh, for dissecting aneurysms, anything that clogs the main pipe of a blood vessel or the heart can act as a beaver dam. Uh, and it causes a great buildup of pressure upstream from the beaver dam. Uh, and it causes decreased pressure downstream from the beaver dam. If this happens in the renal artery, you got yourself, you, you develop hypertension. Does anybody know why that is? talk about that quite a bit. Well, that turns on the R2A system. All right, we just talked about started talking about that in GIGU and endocrinology part of the class. Uh, so, yeah, renal artery stenosis is a big problem, a big cause, number one cause of secondary hypertension. All right? So, <coughs> then we have this concept. Uh, so, if this kayaker is about to go through this little tiny rapids, if this is the reference point, uh, their compadre here is upstream of the of the reference point. Uh, maybe another one is down here. There's another kayak right here. They are downstream, or their truck waiting to pick them up is three miles downstream. So that's an important concept. But in order to talk about upstream and downstream, you have to have a reference point. Okay, maybe this is the mitral valve, and they have mitral valve stenosis, and it's not opening very good, and blood can't uh, can't get out of the left atria, uh, so that causes a backup of blood upstream into the lungs. See how that works, and it causes a decreased amount of blood being ejected from the heart, uh, and that's a downstream problem. See how that works. Right, so everything I talked about, there's a real beaver dam, and the beaver has dammed this little stream up, and it's created a, uh, a little kind of pond here, and it's cut all the water off downstream. All right, so I think I have explained that enough. The other concept here is sometimes when you get a beaver dam, you have an increased velocity of blood, like putting your when you take a whole garden hose and put your thumb over it you've decreased the amount of water coming out of that hose, but when it first comes out, it comes out flying, right? So you might have a blast of blood coming out, right? But nevertheless, it's still decreased quantity, right? So the beaver dam in action. So here's a, let's say this is a renal artery, and you have stenosis, the kidneys. This is the reference point. The kidneys are the kidneys would be downstream, right? There's a kidney. Okay, so what's going to happen to the kidney? Uh, well, you don't have you don't have much blood getting to it, so you have decreased blood flow to the kidney downstream, right? And the R2A system kicks on because it senses uh, the juxtacomerio cells sense that decreased blood flow, and what hormone is released? Renin, right? All right, and then so upstream you have greater pressure because of the beaver dam. So there is stress on these walls. You might over time you might st start to get a big bulging of the 
uh, of the artery here, which is called an aneurysm. And we'll talk about the different types of aneurysms. Because of that pressure, you could even rupture your blood vessel and die. Or you could get a hemorrhage there. All right. Uh, there are three main types of blood vessels. There's arterial system. There's a venous system or venous vessels. And then there's a capillary. Very important concept. They talk about the microcirculation a lot. The microcirculation is there's three types of vessels, arterioles, capillaries, and venules. They make up the microcirculation. So when I say microcirculation, I'm talking about those three. Arteries, of course, are under higher pressure. Uh, because of that, they actually have two extra layers that veins don't have, right? They have an internal and external laminae, right? Veins don't have that. Um, they, they're, they have more tunica media is stronger, right? They're a thicker wall, be partially because of these extra layers, but also because the muscle of the tunica media is more meaty. Um, they're also fairly stretchy. They do have a a property of elasticity and during systole let's say let's make a little heart here it's the ascending order uh, during systole uh, they expand I'll exaggerate it because of all the blood coming out during diastole when nothing's coming out they contract this is a very important concept when they contract, they force blood to keep moving through your system. Because during diastole, there's no, there's no pressure. There's nothing coming out of the heart, for an instance. Why does the blood keep flowing? If you ever cut yourself, the blood steadily flows out uh, of the artery that you've cut. And it's because of this elasticity. But it's also really important here in the ascending aorta. Uh, because the recoil will push blood backwards and it'll slam shut the aortic valve. Semilunar valves are closed because of this property of elasticity of the ascending aorta. So that's a very important concept. We'll come back to that over and over again. Arterioles. What's the first word that pops into your mind when you think arterioles? Not Dr. Doe. Well, maybe it does. Um, but arterioles blood pressure, right? These are the pound for pound. These have more meat in them. Their tunica media is thicker than any other muscle or any other uh, vessel in the body. Uh, and therefore, this is where blood pressure is controlled at the level of the, tun uh, of the arterial. The venule also, blood pressure can be controlled there as well. They're also very meaty uh, little vessels. And let's see... Okay, they can also control the pressure uh, because they can they can open and close the diameter. Um, so they they feed capillaries, and capillaries are very finicky, right? They only they have to have a perfect amount of pressure, uh, so nutrients are driven out into the interstitium, and waste is returned to the distal part of the capillary. So they control the capillary. So they're resistance vessels. Capillaries, of course, are the in between the venules and arterioles. There's three flavors. We've talked about these already. GIGU, I think. Uh, there's continuous, uh, which are stingy. They don't let they don't let nutrients pass through very easily. Like the muscles have these. Fenestrated capillaries. We talked about those in endocrinology. The pituitary has an example of fenestrated. They have holes in the in the cell membrane, which is strange. <clears throat> and then we have discontinuous, which are leaky boats. Uh, so, and the important concept, where they are barrier between, they service the tissue. All of the cells of your body are fed via the capillaries. Right, so here's continuous capillary. It's, you can see there's not much room for nutrients to squeeze through there, maybe. And there's transporters and things through here, right? Uh, and yeah, the muscles have these types, and fat and nervous system. Uh, and there's we've talked about fenestrated capillaries. They have little holes in here. <coughs> and then there's gig there's no holes uh, in the plasma membrane, but there's gigantic gaps between uh, the cells here where 
these discontinuous capillaries can leak like crazy. Bone marrow is a great example <coughs> of that. And uh, let's see, they service the interstitium and the cells by allowing nutrients and waste. We've talked about that already. Um, they're also serviced in a way by uh, lymphatic, or they're, they have partnering. They have a partner called the lymph capillary, which is blind ended. Let's actually look at the picture of that. It's better. Okay, so here's our run of the mill capillary. Uh, so we have a, we have kind of a, the proximal or this is the upstream part of the capillary or more the <coughs> arterial so I got a little frog in my throat this morning sorry about that and then we have the downstream part of the capillary is toward the venule lower hydrostatic pressure here right uh, and then we have a lymphatic vessel uh, that drains away interstitial excess interstitial fluid so this is a really important concept. If we blow this area right up, uh, we can see how the capillary services all the cells. Uh, but the cells sit in a kind of a toothpaste-like gel, similar to the nucleus propulsus. It's made mostly of water, but they sit in that and they wait to be serviced. And oxygen can swim through this interstitium uh, to service the cells. Remember, nutrients are driven out of the proximal, and they return here through the distal. Anybody know why that is? According to Guyton, there's some new research on this that kind of questions this model, but this is the one that's still used, is still used on board books, so <clears throat> the old Starling principle, so that's the way I'm going to teach it. Uh, hydrosta the hydrostatic pressure is less down here, but there's another force, the oncotic pressure right so it's a sucking force so they these nutrients or these waste products co2 gets sucked in here because of the uncotic pressure the uncotic pressure is steady it's because of albumin right <coughs> but the hydrostatic pressure the pushing pressure is stronger here so it pushes nutrients out here pushes blood fluid out here which becomes interstitial fluid once it leaves here and interstitial fluid is also returned here in the distal capillary. Okay, so everything I just said there. Uh, so there's a hydrostatic pressure gradient. <coughs> uh, that That's really important here. And, yep, yeah, everything I just said. Oncotic, I've always learned it's oncotic pressure. Uh, Guyton actually calls it colloid osmotic pressure, so those are both strong AKAs. You need to know both of those. Um, yep, servicing the cell, we've talked about that. Again, how important that is. The, the guyton, the quote, filtration across the capillaries is determined by two things, hydrostatic pressure and colloid osmotic pressure, a.k.a. oncotic pressure. So, and I know there's the, there's the new theory on starling forces, but this is what you need to learn because that's what will be on boards until that changes, if it ever changes. Um, all right, everything is said. Nutrients are pushed out because of the hydrostatic pressure in the proximal capillary. Waste is pulled in in the distal capillary, and pulled in back me in, being back into the bloodstream. That's because of albumin, right? Albumin is the thing that imparts the oncotic pressure. Okay. The other concept is oncotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure are collectively called Starling forces. These are named after Ernest Starling. Remember, there's another starling who the Frank Starling laws of the heart is another important concept. To do, so don't mix up, mix up your starling forces, your starlings. Classic model here uh, if you're a pitcher person. Um, so the capillaries are very finicky about pressure. So upstream part of the capillary or the arterial part of the capillary is about 30 millimeters of mercury. It's a driving force, and it drives oxygen out here. It drives glucose out. Um, uh, that hydrostatic pressure peters out as you get down to the distal capillary, and now you're down to 10 millimeters. Uh, and therefore, that pushing force is overcome by this constant sucking force. The oncotic pressure, which is caused by albumin and other blood proteins, is constant. 
uh, let's say it's let's say it's 20 millimeters of sucking force it can't beat the 30 millimeters of pushing force of hydrostatic pressure um, so but when you get down here and hydrostatic pressure drops down to 10 the 20 is greater and so you the sucking force and in reality there's also oncotic pressure <coughs> the opposite way, right? There's oncotic and hydrostatic pressure generated by the small proteins that are living around here. Uh, but it's insignificant, so it's best to just think of it this way. All right. So after the capillary comes the venules. Sometimes they're called post-capillary venules. Uh, these are veins, but they don't have valves yet. Uh, their job is to collect blood from the capillaries. Uh, and the they get bigger and bigger and bigger. The veins get bigger and bigger. And <clears throat> some veins, of course, have valves. The veins in the lower extremities mainly. Gonadal veins also have valves, which is an important concept when we talk about uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia when the time comes. Uh, they have muscular venules, actually have very muscular walls. Not quite as muscular as arterioles, but they're able to contract help control blood vessels. So here's the venules here. No valves in these guys. <coughs> okay. Veins in general, so they transport mainly deoxygenated blood as well as waste. The CO2 level is much higher there. They serve as a reservoir. They're, <coughs> they're very stretchy, more stretchy than arteries. They have massive uh, ability to stretch and that's called compliance so they have great compliance um, they also have because of that compliance they have the ability to store blood most of the blood in your body is actually stored in veins in your lower extremities and that ability to store blood is called capacitance right so the capacitance of veins is much greater than arteries. The compliance of veins is much greater than arteries, so those are two physiology words you should know. Uh, they have valves, of course, mainly in the lower extremities, popliteal vein, for example, and the posterior tibial and the peroneal veins. They all have tons of valves in them. <coughs> Upper extremities have valves, but not nearly as many. Uh, not even close to the amount of, of vein of valves that are in the lower extremities. Uh, there's enough tunica media still, so all that pooled blood. If a tiger jumps out of the bushes and you get a huge sympathetic outflow from the vasomotor center to the, all the arterioles and veins, everything contracts, so there's still enough tunica media to squirt that blood uh, into the heart and we know that the right side of the heart is very stretchy. Um, so it stretches out and that causes the a reflex contraction, a very extra strong contraction uh, from the right heart and it sends blood flying through the lungs into the left heart. It stretches the left heart and that constricts. Uh, so you get a jump start to run from that tiger and that's Frank Starling's law. Okay, you guys know all that I'm sure. Um, uh, let's see, veins, so the big veins don't control blood pressure. The venules do, though, but the veins don't. They don't have enough tunica media to, uh, to really do that. They can still squirt blood into the heart, but they're not really thought of as, as resistance vessels. And then the pressure slowly, that hydrostatic pressure, by the time you get back to the right heart and the journey is done, well, it's still not done. You got to go to the lungs, I guess, to if you're a red blood cell. Uh, but it's only four millimeters by the time you get to the right ventricle. I talk about the heart being a two-sided creature. I'll say left heart and right heart. That just means, of course, the left heart um, is the left atria and left ventricle. The right heart, I'm referring collectively to the right atria and right ventricle. The left heart, of course, drives the systemic loop of the body, and the right heart drives the pulmonary loop of the body. Uh, lots of stars here. I mean, you're going to be so lost if you... I just uh, assume that you know this backwards. If you don't know this backwards and forwards, you need to... this. You really need to know the parts of this thing, and you should know these by now. A lot of you 
may have crammed for tests and then you forget this stuff. This is something you can't forget. You need to know this like your ABCs. So we know blood comes in from the vena cava, vena cava's, superior vena cava. Is there a valve here, by the way? No, there's no valve here. Um, that's why you can see a jugular pulse in your uh, in your neck sometimes if you're up at 45 degrees in a supine position. Uh, but blood comes in from the head and neck through the superior vena cava, comes in uh, through the inferior vena cava down here and the upper extremities as well drains in through here but it, so here's the pathway so the blood comes into the right atria it goes through this valve which we call the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle after atrial systole finishes filling this off remember and then systole ventricular systole occurs blood is shot up this thing that's the pulmonary trunk uh, and it splits here. It can go both ways. There's only two of these. There's are called pulmonary arteries. They feed the lungs. Uh, the blood is oxygenated. CO2 is left off. It comes back through four pipes. It leaves through two pipes, comes back through four pipes into the left atria, goes through the mitral valve. We don't call this ever the bicuspid valve in clinical pathology. It's always called the mitral valve and it goes into the powerful left ventricle ventricular systole shoots blood up through the very important valve here the aortic valve up the ascending aorta or, and around the aortic arch there's an isthmus here we'll talk about but basically down the descending aorta All right so make sure you know that stuff interventricular septum and we'll talk about this more when we get to the heart uh, but that, that's very another important concept. It separates the right atria from le or right ventricle from left ventricle. It's movable. Um, you can, if you overfill this right ventricle, for reasons we'll talk about later, you can actually get this thing going like that, especially during inspiration, and you can decrease the fill uh, filling capacity of the left ventricle. Uh, Beaver Dan concept can apply to the heart tons of stars you got I'm going to talk about this over and over and over and over so you might as well learn it now the heart can act like a beaver dam how can the heart act like a beaver dam well uh, we have a flow we have a river flow we have blood flowing like this so if you get a beaver dam here at the mitral valve right you're gonna back blood up where into the left atria and into the lungs if you get a beaver dam here, the aortic valves, which happens a lot in older people, well, then you back blood up into the left ventricle, left atria, and into the lungs. Okay, so if you get a tumor here, um, if you get a dissecting aneurysm here, and it pushes the true lumen in, so you can get a beaver dam like that, and it backs blood up the same pathway. But the key here is, the beaver dam, the backup, the upstream backup of blood, it goes right through the lungs. It comes right back in here, right? And then it goes into the left, the right ventricle. And then it backs up into the uh, the right atria. And then it backs up this way, and your jugular veins pop out. And it backs up this way, and your liver swells up. And the liver's connected to your spleen, so your spleen sw swells up. And you're leaking fluid into the... Uh, peritoneal cavity and you get ascites and it goes all the way down uh, and, and you get dependent edema in the ankles. So you can get a pretty wicked backup depending on the severity of the beaver dam. <clears throat> Here's another concept. What if the whole heart acts as a beaver dam? How would that work? Is that possible? Can I erase all this stuff? Yeah, what if the whole heart, can that can that be a beaver dam? Yeah, sure it can. What if, and that's a really common problem in older people, right? They get they get heart failure. So the whole heart is a beaver dam. Uh, so the backup occurs from this point then, right? So you get pulmonary hypertension. You back the blood up into the vein, into the lungs. And then it comes back this way in everything we just said. So the heart itself can become a beaver dam if it fails. 
All right, so with that said, so there's the backup in the lungs. It causes something, it raises the pressure, right? Just like a beaver dam upstream, you have an increased pressure. So you get pulmonary hypertension. That can force fluid into the alveoli. Um, so the lungs, the lungs basically will swell, but the bad part is the, po the alveoli will fill with blood. Uh, and yeah, so that's pulmonary edema. Uh, and then it goes into the right heart. You get right ventricular enlargement uh, from that. Uh, you get something called Kuzmol sign we'll talk about. Uh, the liver will blow up. That's called hepatomegaly. The spleen blows up. That's called splenomegaly. You get fluid in your belly cavity, in the peritoneal cavity, or per I call it peritoneal. I can't get that. That's the, me the medical school I went to was British-based. And so they call it peritoneal, but I know you guys call it peritoneum, peritoneal cavity. Whatever. You get something, you get fluid in your belly, it's called ascites. And then it can back all the way up into the lower extremities and you get swelling around your ankles. That's called dependent edema. Dependent meaning gravity is uh, exacerbating the problem. All right. Um, yeah, so here's my drawing of that. Everything I just said, really, uh, I, my little kind of a single lung model, but if you get a beaver dam, if the heart stops working, the blood backs up like this into the right heart, and it's just, see why you have to know your anatomy? The liver fills up with blood, you get hepatomegaly. Um, and then you got a double venous system going into the liver, right? There's the portal system and the cobble system. Um, so the liver, you get hepatomegaly, you get splenomegaly, you get you get fluid in the peritoneal cavity, you get dependent edema in the feet because of this backup. It all depends how bad the uh, the beaver dam is, but that's a really important concept. So make sure you uh, you grasp that. Okay, everything I just said already. So super important concept. Right here's a patient who has beaver dam, um, so they have left heart failure, so they have left heart enlargement from chronic hypertension. Oh, this one was actually mitral valve stenosis, which is a common problem. So they can't eject blood from the heart. So that's caused a beaver dam all the way into the right side of the heart, all the way into the the jugular veins, and uh, they're blown way out. Takes a breath in, that gets worse. That's Kuzmol's sign. The liver is also swollen up on, on palpation. All right, <clears throat> blood vessel walls. There's a tunica intima, tunica media, tunica adventitia. I expect you to know that like the back of your hand. You should already know that stuff. <clears throat> but we'll go over it. Uh, the tunica intima, watch out for this AKA. Sometimes it's called the tunica uh, interna or just sometimes the uh, intima, it's called. It's the innermost layer of a blood vessel, right? It's in contact with the blood. Tunica media is the middle layer. It's filled with smooth muscle and collagen and elastic uh, fiber. It's stretchy. Tunica adventitia is the outer layer. Sometimes that's called the tunica externa. Watch out for those AKAs. There's a picture tunica uh, media you can see is smooth muscle it has those cigar shaped nuclei <coughs> tunica adventitia is here tunica intima you can see the cell the nuclei these little black dots that's in contact with the blood uh, a little deeper into the tunica that's uh, the innermost layer of course of the capillary vein artery a um, a lymph vessel as well has one. I could have added that in there. It's made up of, if you're a vein, it has three components. Uh, if you're a artery, it has four components. Uh, remember, veins, again, don't have an internal elastic laminae. Um, so that's part of the tunica intima. Uh, if you're a vein, you don't have it. If you're artery, you do have it. The external elastic laminae is, that's not part of the tunic intima, though. Actually, the tunic, the internal elastic laminae separates 
Tunica Intima from the Tunica Media. We'll see a picture of that in a second. It's made of layers. The official layers are an endothelium. When I say endothelium, I just mean a whole bunch of cells. It's a single layer of simple squamous cells that are making up this medium-sized artery. That's the the endothelium or the endothelial layer or endothelial cells. Those are all kind of AKAs. Endothelium means I'm talking about all of these cells together. Then they sit on a basal lamina, right? Cells don't like to not sit on things, so there's a basal lamina, which is connective tissue. There is a subendothelial layer, which is not very exciting. If you're an artery, there's an internal elastic laminae that is considered part of the tunica intima. It's full of Swiss cheese. It's more for strength, they think. They're not 100% sure the functions of it, but they think it's just for extra strength because arteries under a much greater pressure. Is a really nice picture of a blood vessel. If we blow this region up right here, let's look at the layers again, much better than I drew it. Uh, so there's the endothelial cells, the tunic intima. They sit on a basal lamina, which is light blue. Uh, and then there's that weird subendothelial layer of connective tissue. And if you're an artery, you have this extra, for extra strength, you have an internal elastic lamina here. And once you pass that, now we're into the tunica media here. And then there's the external elastic lamina. And then you're in the tunica adventitia where all the blood vessels are. <coughs> yes, vasovasorum, right? We'll get to that, though. You're not going to like this, these endothelial cells because they are very, very busy. Um, they are found in all arteries, arterioles. Capillaries even have a, a kind of wimpy endothelial layer. Uh, venules, veins. Uh, even the lymph system has them. Um, embryologically, they are made from hemangioblasts. Do we remember that from back in the day? It seems like a long time ago. But uh, so the and where do hemangioblasts? They come from mesoderm. So that's where they are derived from. The board question could say either one of those. Uh, they're also found in the heart, but you don't call them endothelial cells. You call them endocardial cells, but they're the same thing. They're simple squamous cells. And histologically speaking, they're a single layer of cells. We said they're simple squamous. We already talked about that. You call them endothelial cells. Um, they do create a lumen. The bigger the blood vessel, the more endothelial cells are needed to create the lumen. Uh, some capillaries are so small that one endothelial cell uh, can actually wrap around on, it, on itself. And so tiny capillaries are made of only one endothelial cell. There's its nucleus. Okay, the luminal surface. Uh, has some very important little antennas sticking out of it, tasting the blood that flows by. Uh, those are receptors. So we have insulin receptors are super important, uh, histamine receptors. The one I'm going to really talk about is LDL receptors because people with high cholesterol sometimes have mutations in these LDL receptors. So they're really imp that's an important concept. So here's a here's an endothelial cell right here. Right there's the uh, there's the lipid bilayer, and here is I mean you don't have to know all these parts for me that's getting too deep, uh, but you do need to know this is a uh, this is a endo the LDL receptor, and its job is to look for an LDL molecule that's swimming by and grab it. So once these bind together, this whole ball of wax is sucked into the center of the cell. Uh, where this is all degraded and recycled. And remember, the LDL is filled with cholesterol and fats as well. So you can, I mean, the cholesterol is needed, right? It's needed to make the, repair the membrane that's broken, repair organelles. So you need some of the cholesterol. 
Uh, so that is important. So LDL grabs or, or is grabbed by these LDL receptors. It's pulled by endocytosis inside the cell uh, where it can be uh, utilized by the cell. So LDL mutations, uh, they will, if, if you can't, if these don't work and you can't grab the LDL, well then the LDL is just, they go floating around the body and they get in trouble. Uh, because they're filled with cholesterol. Uh, so they can break down and dump the cholesterol. <clears throat> Some cholesterol is uh, free form uh, in the bloodstream, but they can dump their load. But more importantly, they're mischievous. They tend not to obey the laminar flow rule. And they can bump and roll along blood vessels, and they can look for cracks between endothelial cells. And they can sneak underneath the endothelium uh, and get between the endothelium and the tunica media and the, a wicked inflammation process can occur. The body sees that and doesn't like it and attacks and you get a wicked inflammation. That is the start of atherosclerosis. Okay, so people with mutations, um, they have too much LDL rolling around. So they have uh, conditions like hypercholesterolemia because some of those uh, those LDLs have broken and dumped cholesterol into the bloodstream. And they've also dumped uh, lipids in there, so they have hypolipoproteinemia. Why cholesterol? Remember, the I already said this, but uh, that's what an LDL, it's a little ball that floats, but inside the ball you have cholesterol esters, which is the package form of cholesterol. Uh, unester, uh, unesterified cholesterol, flat-out cholesterol, is packed in the wall uh, of the little ball as well. And there's some fat, triisoglyceride or, tri or triglyceride. Those are all AKs for fat. There's uh, apple lipoprotein uh, B100 also kind of secures the little ball, makes it strong. <coughs> yeah, so everything I said. So if you get... Uh, LDLs floating around and cholesterol floating around, they can squeeze between breaks between the uh, between the tunica intima or in, uh, intima, and they can between those endothelial cells. They get under there and they spark atherosclerosis. Everything I already said, right? And that uh, this what is this plaque stuff? It's really LDLs. Uh, they get in. We'll talk about that when the time comes. But they get in. They become oxidized. Uh, and a wicked inflammation occurs. Smooth muscle even joins the party. Really, this plaque is made of foam cells, which is, which are kind of dead macrophage, which have overeaten, and smooth muscle, which have become phagocytic. That's what makes up this plaque. All right, the endothelial cell functions. They're very, very busy. They secrete all kinds of juice, our little endothelial cells. Uh, most of the juice soaks into the tunica media and adventitia. Some of the juice soaks outside and makes like uh, makes the endothelial slippery. Uh, so they they have they secrete a lot of stuff: collagens, laminin, uh, prostacyclin, uh, one of the slippery three. We'll look at uh, endothelin, nitric oxide, really important, kind of uh, yin and yang here. Vasodilator powerful vasoconstrictor, von Willebrand factor, super potent blood clotter. You need von Willebrand factor. This has a role in COVID-19 we'll talk about, I think, next time. And, yep, some very important enzymes are made by endothelial cells and live on the surface of endothelial cells uh, bathed in blood. Uh, angiotensin, we talked about this, didn't we, already in in uh, endocrinology. Uh, there's the ACE receptor uh, that is super, super important for making angiotensin 2. There's the ACE2 receptor, super, super important for making angiotensin 1 7, right? That's the good guy. Um, let's see. The receptors, of course, ACE2 binds with the ACE2 receptor. Uh, angiotensin 1 7 binds to the MOS receptor talked about that already in endocrinology. Uh, ACE2's job is to convert angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7. Angiotensin 1-7 binds to the MOS receptor. All right. We also know from our lecture in 
endocrinology, ACE2 is one way that COVID-19 binds in order to gain entry. Now we have a mutation at the uh, that's been the last week or so, um, and so there might be another way now for COVID-19 or for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to get in and cause COVID-19. Um, so we'll have to wait to see how that story unfolds. It's about 50% uh, more permeable or more uh, infectious than uh, the current strain that's going around. The endothelial cells have other functions. It acts as a barrier, semi-permeable barrier. So if you get if you get bugs in tissue, uh, it's not going to get into the bloodstream. Or if you have blood bugs in your blood, it's not going to get out into the tissue. Uh, tight has really strong tight junctions between those endothelial cells, uh, which is pretty hard to get through those. Um, there are ways to get across the endothelium. Um, I took all these slides out a while ago. We're getting too deep into physiology, but simple diffusion, active transport, receptive mediated endocytosis, uh, fenestrations. So you should know those, but not so much for my class. I do usually ask a question about capillaries, though. So uh, another important function: it uh, secretes some slippery molecules, the slippery three. And they make the surface, the luminar surface, slippery so platelets don't start sticking and causing blood clots. And even though everybody always calls them blood clots, it's not really correct to call a, a clotting of blood inside the lumen a blood clot. That's thrombus. Uh, that is thrombus, not a blood clot. Blood clot occurs outside of a blood vessel or in the tunica media of a blood vessel, but in the lumen it's called thrombus formation, but everybody doesn't really obey that law very well. It's just kind of handy to say, oh, there's a clotting of blood, because it is, but it's a little bit different. Slippery three are important. Um, so yeah, you don't want you don't want platelets sticking in an artery because it'll build up a big, big clot, right? If we have a cross-sectional view and you start to get a party of of platelets here and you start getting a clot going on, what happens if a piece breaks loose? Right? What happens if that's in your uh, happening in your left ventricle? Well you're sending a bomb through the uh, through the arterial system and that bomb is going to eventually go into smaller, progressively smaller and smaller arteries until it gets stuck and then it causes a beaver dam. Everything downstream from the vessel that gets stuck will die. If it gets up into your noodle, up into your brain through the internal carotid artery, you're going to have a stroke. Right? It might get into the coronary artery, you're going to have a heart attack. Maybe it'll get into your renal artery and you're going to get hypertension from that. Or maybe it completely blocks the blood vessel. Full beaver dam and you lose a piece of your kidney or you lose your entire kidney. These arterial thrombi are incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Venous thrombi are dangerous as well, but not nearly as dangerous as the arterial thrombi. So we need those, we need that slippery, we need the endothelial surface very, very slippery. It's kept slippery by uh, molecules that are collectively called anticoagulants or antithrombogenic molecules. I like that word thrombogenic. What does that mean? Anti-thrombogenic. Well, thrombo is clotting. Genic means a process that happens. So uh, thrombogenic means a clotting process. Anti means the opposite. So this is a, this is a molecule that prevents blood clotting, and prevents thrombus formation. Okay, here are the slippery three. The toilet paper is how I remember those. I mean, you can use whatever you want. You need to know these thrombomodulin, tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, uh, and prostacyclin. Those are the slippery three. They all are secreted by endothelial cells, uh, and they make the surface slippery. In certain diseases, uh, the endothelial cells are mutated. The central dogma is messed up, and these are messed up. And are not, they don't work. They're not slippery, and those people are at risk for blood clots. Or thrombus formation, I should say. Uh, endothelial cell injury can also make 
the endothelial cells. If an endothelial cell's injury, it tends to do two things, sometimes simultaneously. It stops secreting the slippery three, and it oversecretes things like von Willebrand factor, the clotting uh, agents. Uh, so you you tend to become a clotter or attempt to make thrombosis. But what can injure endothelial cells? <coughs> Excuse me. Chronic hypertension. Right? If you have too much pressure in the pipes, you can beat up those pipes and damage the endothelial cells, and they can say, hey, too much pressure. I'm, I'm not going to make the slippery three anymore. Or, hey, I'm going to over-secrete prothrombogenic molecules like von Willebrand factor. Uh, turbulent blood flow, maybe you're not hypertensive, but you have a tumor, and it's caught, the beaver dam uh, is causing a spray of blood, and it's beating up the lumen. And so that can damage the endothelial cells in that region. Aneurysm can do that. They cause non-laminar blood flow. Vessel wall tumor, atherosclerosis. Uh, vessel wall injury, a myocardial infarction, can kill off some of the tissue and the endothelial cells can become uh, cranky because of that, and maybe even a little hypoxic. Vasculitis, infection of the blood vessel. These can all upset the endothelial cells where they stop making the slippery three. Catheter injury, you get in a angioplasty of the heart to remove plaque. Whoops, poked, you're too rough on the uh, turning the corner, and you've injured the endothelial cells, and they stop making the slippery three, and you end up getting a clot there and end up getting a heart attack because of the procedure. Chronic inflammation, tobacco smoke. Some people can handle smoke. <clears throat> Many people can't. And they get things like Berger's disease, the chronic inflammation of the uh, arteries. And if some endothelial cells respond to tobacco smoke by stop making the slipper three. Uh, chronic inflammation from air pollution. Some people are sensitive to that. Bacterial endotoxins, radiation therapy, metabolic abnormalities, the list goes on and on, homocystinemia. These are all piss off the endothelial cells and increase the risk for thrombus. Who cares? <clears throat> well, if your endothelial cell gets injured, as I said, it leads to some deadly stuff like thrombus formation. And we said arterial thrombus formation is incredibly dangerous. Right? It can release uh, emboli, which can cause a stroke, myocardial infarction. Uh, it can cause hypertension if it gets in the renal artery. Okay, we'll talk about these things as when the time comes. Um, you also have deep vein thrombosis. Uh, if the, the endothelial cells on the venous side get injured, you can clot down there. It's not as dangerous because blood clots usually end up as pulmonary embolisms in the lungs if they break loose. But... If big ones break loose, we'll look at saddle. But we'll look at a case of a saddle emboli, which occurs. A huge clot can break loose uh, from some of the, f the deep femoral artery, um, and it can get stuck in the heart and kill people. I'll show you a case where it does that, uh, or it can weaken the blood vessel wall and and encourage an aneurysm. The response to injury theory is you need to know what that is. I think you've studied it already. Uh, but that's when an endothelial cell gets injured by any of those mechanisms, hypertension, whatever we just talked about. And we kind of already talked about this. It gets mad, and it stops producing things like the slippery three, or it overproduces some, some pro-coagulation uh, molecules like von Willebrand factor. Right. So let's look at these. Uh, it overproduces the pro, meaning, yeah, it's going to happen. Thrombogenic means clot. Genic is the process. So pro-thrombogenic molecules like a von Willebrand factor, uh, plasminogen activator, inhibitor. Um, so those guys, will, if too much of that's around, your blood will overclot. And the endothelial cells makes all these, right? And there's the slippery three. Again, thrombomodulin, tissue, plasminogen activator, prostacyclin. Uh, so, yeah, so that's what happens. That's called the response, been studied greatly, the response to injury. And it could be called this response to endothelial cell injury. 
right? But both of those increase the chance of the super deadly arterial thrombus formation and the chance of an arterial, a dangerous arterial embolism. All right. See you guys later.